Good morning, everyone. And thanks for joining us this morning for our panel, The Next Generation of TV Measurement. Um, I'm Cheryl Idell, and I'll be moderating um, our panel this morning. And what I want to do first is just sort of lay out for you the format and some of the uh, ground rules of, uh, of how we're going to work this panel today. First of all, because this is such a sort of strange environment hearing all the noise going on in the background, how about uh, thumbs up if you can hear me if you're sitting down here. Okay, I just want to make sure I wasn't talking to myself. It was kind of hard to tell. Um, so the way that we want to do this today, I've been calling it, um, it'll be more like The View than The Tonight Show, to put it in TV terms. Um, I'm going to sit down there with everyone and be just as much a part of the panel um, as uh, opposed to purely being a moderator. We also really want to encourage a lot of questions from you guys, from the audience. So rather than just waiting till the end, our, our panel is set up with five sort of question topics. And we're going to encourage questions at the end of each topic so that we can really get you engaged in, in asking questions of us as we're doing this. Um, I am not going to read the bios of all of us. Um, you can go online um, on the NAPB site. Those bios are there. You can learn everything you want to learn about the four of us that way. We do not have AV. We don't have slides. So you are fortunate enough to stare at our four faces um, with no other material um, for the next 45 minutes because um, that will be what's on the monitor in front of you. Uh, but we decided we really wanted to have a dialogue um, rather than really sharing a lot of data because as, as a measurement panel, we could have gotten really data heavy and, and didn't want to do that. Um, and, and the last thing I'd like to do, just so we have a sense of who chose to, to sit here and, and join us this morning, is get a little bit of a sense with a show of hands of who is in the audience. How many of you here are um, TV programmers who are looking for content? He really is one. Um, <laughs> he's very excited about it. <laughs> um, <laughs> how many of you are, are research executives or are involved in research? They're all from Nielsen. No. Um, <laughs> and how many of you are, um, from, are not from the United States or looking to do business internationally here? OK, I think that gives us a little bit of a sense of of who we're talking to. We really wanted to keep our, our conversation going that way. So I'm going to sit down now and, um, and get this panel started. And what I'm going to do is ask each of the panelists to tell us what they do and what their company does in the space of TV measurement, since that is the, the topic of this. Um, I'll start before I sit down. Um, you know, I work for the Nielsen Company. And I am um, head of product leadership for our television audience measurement products. And Nielsen, um, as I would think everyone in the audience knows, um, is the provider of television audience ratings um, in the United States and around the world, locally and nationally, as well as online um, and mobile audience measurement, as well as um, consumer um, shopping. So what we do is really measure what people buy and what people watch, and then put that data together um, for advertisers to have a more holistic picture of what people are watching and what people are buying. And with that, why don't we start with um, Mark, whose name I'm going to say wrong, so I wrote down a transliteration. Um, PSNN from, uh, from Google. We've got Kathy Hetzel from um, RentTrack. And we've got David Birch from TubeMogul. Thanks, Cheryl. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm Mark Piesinen from uh, Google TV Ads. Okay. Can you hear now? How's that? Better? How about a plus go. one, a thumbs up from the back? OK. Uh, thanks, Cheryl. I'm Mark Piesen, and I'm the Director of Strategic Partner Development for Google TV Ads. And Google TV Ads um, is a um, ad network for linear television. It's a digital marketplace for buying and selling uh, commercial inventory using an online interface that's integrated with the rest of Google ad pro uh, products. And we, um, I guess, created our own audience research and measurement system for um, counting noses, for counting basic ad views on linear television. Um, and we use uh, a large sample of set-top box data um, as the kind of basis for the market-making mechanism in our, in our exchange. So unlike Nielsen or Rentrack, we don't uh, create third-party research reports that we, uh, that we license to third parties. 
we've sort of created our own ecosystem, our own marketplace, and probably as is the Google way, we invented our own measurement system to, uh, to measure ad views on television. Good morning. I'm Kathy Hetzel. I'm president of the AMI division for the Rentrack Corporation. And for those of you um, who know us, we started in the uh, home video—I'm sorry, home video business—and expanded to worldwide box office. In addition to that, for our focus today around our television and products, we measure 100% of all on-demand viewing here in the U.S. and in Canada and we are uh, moving those products internationally as well. In addition to that, we have linear television products called TV Essentials and Station View Essentials, where we use a database of set-top box uh, information and measure 17 million households in the US. In addition to that, we also have services to measure viewing of content on both mobile devices as well as the internet. And our goal, of course, over time is to roll all of that information up into a, a multi-screen view so that our customers have the opportunity to really understand viewing across all platforms. My name is David Birch, and I head up research at TubeMogul. Uh, we are an online video advertising and analytics company. We track about three to four billion video streams a month, including detailed engagement and discovery and ad effectiveness data across uh, advertising. So we track across a media buyer's entire video buy and uh, broadcast and media companies for a content stream in mobile, on gaming consoles, and online, and on PCs, rather. Great. Thanks, everyone. Um, can you hear me now with this thing here? So what we're going to do, this, um, you know, this panel has a really straightforward title, right? The Next Generation of TV Measurement. Um, pretty simple. So what we thought we would do is break that down um, because it's so simple that we really wanted to define what some of these different terms are. So we're going to start out um, by describing really what we see as the next generation of TV. Because before we can talk about the measurement of that, we need to try to be on, on some sort of playing field or know where we each stand about how we even define TV. And I, I would think TubeMogul defines TV differently than Google defines TV, and, and everyone here probably has their own definition. I, I would love for you to start, David, um, since you are probably in, in the least traditional TV space of, of the four of us. Well, I'm, I'm obviously a bit biased because we measure part of the pie, but I think you know, TV is the, is the entertainment. It's the lean forward experience. It's the, the premium content. And you know, I think that's why a device like an iPad matters so much is because it more mirrors kind of traditional how you'd watch television. You're relaxing, you're sitting down. So I mean, I view it more as, as the content and you know, it kind of stops there and kind of it's a lean forward experience. It's different from kind of how you might think of a viral video or a web video. It's obviously more premium, undivided attention. So the video analytics that, that you're providing are for all sorts of online video, what you would consider TV online video as well as other? So yeah, we're tracking on the ad side and the content side um, a lot of the top television broadcasters. So we're in the player itself and we're tracking how they got there, what they did when they were there, how long they watched, metrics like that. So and that spans kind of like phones, iPads, gaming consoles and online. Great. I think from our perspective, we look at television as being either on demand or linear, traditional television. And both of those are truly television in the view of Rentrack. And I would say that we break our measurement systems down in order to look at content that's delivered on demand. And so sometimes you deliver just pieces of content and the client pulls that content and chooses to watch specific pieces of content or the other side of TV, and I think they're both TV, just different types of TV, is traditional TV where there's a stream that you're watching that you tune in at any given point in time into um, watching traditional television. And that's how we think of it, but we do think of it as all TV. You might be surprised, and people in the audience might be surprised by my answer uh, from Google, um, but we have invested uh, literally hundreds of engineering man hours in understanding 
um, commercial engagement and audience engagement with good old fashioned 30 second spots on linear television. So um, within the, the, the groups of in, the engineering and product and sales groups at Google who are interested in an expanded definition of television, uh, it, our, our interest in television and, and our activities in television and our investments in television, believe it or not, um, started with um, and, and when we spend a lot of energy with good old fashioned 30 second spots on linear television. Um, that, that's the business that I'm in. Um, and of course, our definition of television would, would expand in concentric, concentric circles to include uh, you know, household addressable advertising that's evolving out of, out of good old fashioned linear television, um, ad supported VOD, um, interactive applications on television, either through the EBIF uh, rollout or you know polling on, uh, on on the canoe platform or anything that might happen in the future with internet connected TVs. So, um, and from a Nielsen perspective, we spend a lot of time talking about that definition of TV because we've got a lot of traditional definitions. A lot of our historical measures are based on rules that the industry. Um, and working with the industry have come to define TV. And, and you know, what we're now uh, really wrestling with is, is it the box, right? Is, is measuring TV, measuring what comes out of the TV screen? Um, do you still define it as TV when it's not coming out of a TV screen and it's coming out of other devices? You seem to be talking a lot about the TV set. Um, and I think, um, I'm just raising this because I think as an industry, these are, these are terms that we're going to have to redefine because the definitions are blurring. Um, and, and as there are folks here that are out there buying content and they're buying it for all these different platforms and then looking at the ad models around all of that content, the way we redefine the terms of our industry um, are going to kind of set the stage for moving forward. And I know we wrestle a lot with that. Is it, is it the device? Is it the content? that defines what is TV? I think it's the audience. I mean, and, and I think the, um, the sort of commercial measurement systems of the future and of the very near future are going to have to be able to identify specific audiences and not necessarily programs. And uh, an, a corollary to that is um, we're going to have to be able to measure ad impressions, com you know, unique commercial impressions a little bit better than, than 30 second spots. So I think the next generation of television measurement is going to have to be able to identify, um, to be able to measure, you know, the audience of recreational ve vehicle owners who watched, you know, how many commercial impressions did an advertiser get among the sort of exotic demographic of RV owners who make $250,000 a year and support charities across their viewing, um, on the web and television and mobile and, and, and other things. I would so, agree with Mark on the audience side and take it a step further and say that um, it starts with the targeting. So our approach to audience measurement is all about databases and integrating various databases with television viewing. And again, that could be online television viewing um, that could be done on a TV set, a computer, or on a mobile device of some sort, or it's linear television, traditional television viewing that could be done elsewhere. But the larger the database that you have available to you, the opportunity for you to be able to take the types of information that Mark is referencing and integrate that with television viewing to find those viewers on the front end so that you're targeting the viewers who are more likely to buy a $250,000, what, did you say car? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> there are two of people out there that will do that and we'll find them. Um, but then we have the opportunity to be able to then send advertising to those specific groups right. and then on the back end measure the effectiveness against that target. And so I think um, it's both on the front end of being able to target, enhance targeting effectively, and then also to make sure that we've actually reached those people with the advertising, uh, measure how long they've engaged with us or duration, et cetera. Um, what other things those people do that we can then develop patterns throughout the, um, and I know you do a lot of that work as well, developing the patterns throughout the data sets that we have in order to improve the effectiveness of advertising. 
Well, a lot of it can go beyond demographics is what's cool about it. Is you, you know someone who watched like an RV ad three months ago also um, clicked on an ad for, you know, like Velveeta or something, you know, two weeks later. And you can start to see unexpected patterns in the data and use that to target the ads, which can get really cool. So, so what I'm, I'm hearing, and it sort of has led into what was our next, the next sort of breakdown of the title of this, which is, you know, what we each mean by TV measurement. And I'm hearing a big shift here from measuring TV audiences to programs to really measuring the audiences and the advertising um, more so than the viewing to content of, you know, the entertainment content of the program. Um, so is that a shift that you're seeing in, in TV measurement? And, you know, if that's the case, you know, I'll ask the question coming from Nielsen, what's the role of TV ratings, of television audience ratings for programming, um, you know, that's getting exchanged here at this conference? Um, do we need to measure the eyeballs to the shows, um, or does the role of that change, and how does it change moving forward? I would say both are really important. Um, I think it is really important to understand the viewership to specific shows. Um, it, it, it is a currency and a basket full of currencies that exist today that allow us to be able to um, think about what the likelihood of the size of the audience is for a particular program, which is a guide for advertisers to understand where to place their buys, et cetera. That combined with the information about uh, these databases that we're talking about and in integrating the, behavior, the viewing habits of those profiles or, or uh, clusters that we create in the data allows us to get more exact about which programs we place shows in. And then also, um, I, I do think that content will always be tremendously important. And not to be forgotten on traditional television are the live events like the sporting events and the Grammy Awards and the, all of those things that um, we really have to have some historical view of what the audiences look like for that in order to be able to help advertisers going forward. So I would say both the, the program ratings are important as well as the individual ad engagements that occur during the programs. Well, when we created um, our measurement system for Google TV ads, we started from a different place. We started from the place of you know, Google advertisers, Google search advertisers and display advertisers who had sort of grown up with, uh, I mean, many of these companies were, you know, came to life in 1996 or 1997. Uh, they, they, their entire uh, definition of marketing was digital marketing, internet marketing, and, and search marketing done the Google way. Um, and so they didn't really, I mean, many of the advertisers who advertise on linear television through Google TV ads, I mean, half of them have never been on television before. So we've, we've converted whole families of advertisers, whole categories of advertisers to traditional television. And they started from a place where when they bought Google search advertising, they were just paying for those people who clicked on their ads. And so when we created a system of measurement for linear television, we started with those basic premises of, you know, targetability, accountability, data-based marketing decisions, and only pay for people who click on your ad. Now, the, the analog to television, pre-household addressable advertising, is only pay for those people who watched your ad. So our measurement system uh, came out into television the same season that C3, C3 ratings came out. And we had this... You know, our system took it even one step further where we were only charging advertisers for people, uh, you know, for commercial impressions to your specific 30 second spot or 15 second spot or 90 second spot. So we didn't even go to program ratings or even uh, commercial ratings. We, we tried to tell advertisers, you know, 4,208 people watched your ad. Is it people or is it 4,208 4, set-top oh, boxes? The Nielsen guy got me. Yeah. <laughs> so it was 4,208 <laughs> set-top boxes uh, received your ad. rendered an, an and ad And maybe somebody was there. Maybe, maybe the dog, maybe there were eight people. <laughs> the the set-top box was on. One comment on programming is, and the importance of program ratings is that 
Um, it is important for uh, the networks, for example, <laughs> our network clients, to be able to draw people to their networks. And I think that um, it, it, it depends on the business question that the network is trying to answer. Of course, advertising runs the world, and we all know that, and that is the most important thing that we measure. Having said that, the content that contains that advertising is what draws people to it. And so I think that, that for that other reason, it depends on exactly what business question you're trying to answer. If you understand and look at the competitive performance of shows that run at the same time as your show, for example, you have the opportunity to change your schedule or to add more programs that are bringing high appeal to your network by looking at those program ratings. So once again, it comes back to the business question being asked by the, by the network or the advertiser. Just one, one thing. Yeah, I didn't, I, I didn't want, um, data is not commoditizing content. And I, yeah, I think what I was trying to say, you know, the more data you have, the more money goes to content because an advertiser knows more about the audience they're buying. And I think that's an important Good distinction point. to make. You're growing the pie, you're not kind of slicing the existing pie. So as promised, before I go into another kind of series of questions, we're at around our halfway point. So I wanted to see if there are any questions um, in the audience so we don't just wait until the last sort of two minutes. Um, so I think there are a couple of folks wandering around with mics. And if anybody does have a question on sort of this first path, because I think we're going to get now, we're going to get more into some of the details about different measurement techniques and, and the techniques we see in the future and different ad models that we see. So why don't we do, there's a question right here. Hello. Hi, I'm, I'm Joanna Breen with TouchStorm. I am interested to know how advertisers are understanding and appreciating the viewer who is identified by set-top box versus the viewer who pushes the button and watches the content online. Do they see the difference and how do they perceive it? Um, well, I'll... Do we need to repeat the question yeah, so the people in the audience hear it? Go ahead. So the, the question was, um, do advertisers, I'll, I'm going to paraphrase it, do advertisers see a different value in folks who um, interact with an ad online versus an ad that they see on television? Um, I mean, we spent a lot of time at, at Google TV ads trying to, um, trying to identify that very thing. And again, we're, I, I think a, a more a traditional media agency might have a, a traditional media agency buyer might give you a different answer than, than I'm about to. Uh, but the answer from the perspective of the participant, participants in our ecosystem is a lot of them are, are trying to relate television uh, viewing behavior and commercial ad impressions to a metric that they know, which are digital media impressions uh, and digital media metrics. So we spent a lot of time trying to answer for our advertisers how many commercial impressions translate to a website visit, uh, or how many commercial impressions translate to you know, a, an e-commerce transaction. Because again, remember, half of our advertisers never advertised on television before Google TV ads. Their whole definition of marketing was you know, search query volume times cost per click equals website visits. And, and they had very, a very good under, have a very good understanding of the throughput of if somebody lands on their home page, you know, where they fall off through the transaction funnel getting out to an e-commerce transaction. So we spent a lot of our time trying to relate traditional television viewing to digital transaction, digital advertising metrics. So for them, they are trying to understand the value of a, of a linear television commercial ad impression in you know, how many cruise vacations did I book as a result of, 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 you know, of, of showing my, my, uh, my ad on TV. I, I think it's really hard to quantify that this person A saw this commercial about this cruise and then went out and bought a cruise. However, I do think that by um, using databases to find the targets of people more likely to buy cruises. And in the end, the advertiser is interested in 
did we sell more cruises? And I don't think that it has to be as direct as that one-to-one -one relationship between the ad and the person buying. Um, but I do think that there are ways to look at the effectiveness of advertising based on trying different types of targeting. Yeah, I, I would also say that I think advertisers know that there are different values to different points in the funnel. And so and we, we were having a discussion in the speaker room before we came out here about, you know, is there a value in having online GRPs since online has grown up as an interactive measurement, a cost per something. Um, and there are different needs for different metrics. And so looking at just the, you know, the, the um, audience metric and comparing TV to online from the standpoint of who had the opportunity to see this is a starting point that's always been there in media planning that lets you at least evaluate one media type to another. And then when you get to the next stage in the purchase funnel, an advertiser has a different need for different kinds of metrics and will want, you know, and need the additional data to value the reason why they went online because they knew they could do something different with online, um, but they might not be able to get the broad awareness they could get for TV. So each, I think advertisers are really beginning to understand, they are beginning to understand that there is a different reason to use each of these types, then you need a different metric um, to value the audiences for each of the media types because they serve a different purpose. And, and I think that's part of that. We've got two here. Whoever gets the mic first. It's up to you, Mike Man. Hi. How you doing? Dan Hassan from BCM. So, uh, Mark, you talked earlier about uh, eBiff and Canoe and um, mm -hmm. kind of what we're seeing with interactive TV uh, beginning to roll out now uh, across the U.S. You know, we at BCM do a very similar thing, but on a local level. How do you see uh, the world of eBiff and interactive affecting what you do uh, in audience measurement and then rolling that up into engagement and, for, and therefore? Um, well, uh, we're there was um, a guy on the stage here yesterday from Demand Media who was talking about their business model and how they use signals, uh, you know, a variety of signals to help them make editorial decisions. So from, from the broadest perspective, um, you know, if, you know, one of, one of the products that's in the, in the, the launch uh, path for Canoe is a polling application. Um, and if you have a, a like button, uh, in, a, in an eBIF enabled polling application across the canoe infrastructure, uh, those likes, uh, thumbs up like badges, could turn into a signal for, for you know, ad relevance or um, you know, just basic affinity toward, towards advertising. Um, same thing with, um, you know, with you know, eBIF enabled applications as well. Um, the, uh, you know, the basic RFI model of, of, of EBIF is a, is a fantastic signal, right? It, you know, I like your product, send me a three ounce, you know, sampler of your shampoo or something. So if you have a, a sort of measurement regime that, that's able to take all of these different signals as inputs and infer relevance from the, you know, from all the signals that they're, they're showing you, then, then that's how I see, you know, Canoe and EBIF and those sorts of things playing into a broader based uh, measurement system. Now, could you productize those? Could you, could you turn that into like third party commercial research that someone will, will buy and sell? I don't know, but in our ecosystem, we would, we'd love to have that. I mean, I'd, I'd love to have canoe enabled like badges, uh, you know, when people vote on commercials they like or dislike, that'd be awesome. We be, do be a, a very powerful of, signal. I'm sorry. We do a lot of work with our partner Dish on interactive, and as, as you may know, Dish has a lot of interactivity on their system, and they were, are one of the first who really were out there with interactive applications. And we have the opportunity, of course, as their data partner, to get all the data from um, their interactions. And we measure not only did someone click through and watch the ad, but how long they stayed there, what they did within, within the ad, and uh, a lot of really deep information that DISH provides to their interactive advertisers. And what we have seen um, from DISH is, is that companies like Mattel, for example, first started with DISH and um, worked on a, an interactive application for Barbie, which has since been rolled out across many of the cable operators. And we see that expansion of that relationship so I would say that the early advertisers on Interactive are finding value 
Um, it doesn't work for everything. It's not going to really work for the Macy's weekend sale um, to be interactive. But for products where you're trying to build loyalty to your brand and you want to provide more information about that product to those customers who choose to elect, just like with on-demand television, who elect to watch that, you have a great opportunity with interactivity. I think it's going to be an interesting thing to see roll out. Well, I mean, I defer to the people with set-top box data for set-top box stuff, but I know in terms of video advertising that we, we track, if you can tap into Facebook somehow, if you can get a Facebook like link in there, it gives you a lot. Like if the call to action is click to a brand site, yeah, you know, or instead of that, if you put like a Facebook like or a share on Facebook, the click through rates go up across categories that we've seen and it amplifies kind of earned media in the sense that they're automatically sharing it with their friends when they like something. Um, and it tells you something about the, the audience, about the viewer that you can use later and you know, find them again. I think we had one more question down here that we'll take and then we'll go back into some of our panel questions. Traditionally, traditionally the valued uh, viewer has been a younger demographic, 1825, 1839, somewhere in there. But with the pretty seismic shift in economic clout, longevity, political influence of that plus 45 demographic, do you see any change in the advertiser interest or your own research? Um, yeah, so the question is, um, are we seeing a change and a shift to an older demographic um, beyond that traditional 45, 49, 54 year old, um, given the shifting population? And, and we've actually been doing a lot of work um, in this area at Nielsen where we're able to look at purchasing of all sorts of products and who is doing that purchasing, um, as well as the viewing patterns and, and connect those things. And we see a tremendous shift actually. And it's not necessarily a shift in terms of the purchase happening by, by older people, that's always been there. Um, and, and the economic ability of the older segment has actually always been there to buy more stuff because they have more disposable income. Um, but we are seeing much more interest from the advertisers now as they're recognizing um, that this group is, is more um, affluent and that they will shift their brand um, decisions as well. There used to be a point of view that once somebody is at that stage, it's so hard to get them to change um, brands and to change their attitudes. And I think we're seeing that shift because of the way that people get information now um, there's a way to learn about new brands and new products that's so much easier than um, used to exist. So we're absolutely seeing that interest. Um, we're also seeing a lot of interest from the media companies that we work with, um, asking us to help them prove the value of that audience to shift the industry from this traditional mindset of once somebody goes beyond 49, I shouldn't be targeting them. Um, so I think you're going to see a lot more about that, and we, we think it's a very real phenomenon. I think Alan Wurzel, and um, I've heard it both said by Alan Wurzel and then also by David Poltrak, yes. where he said that um, if an advertiser comes to him and says that uh, there's no value in people that are over 55 years of age, that that's fine. He'll go sell that to somebody else um, and not deliver those people to that advertiser, because I think that they really see um, a shift, as, as Cheryl has said, in the, uh, in the purchasing power of people that are beyond the traditional demographics that we've used to purchase media. I, I think one of the big challenges is that the conventional wisdom is, well, my traditional TV buy is going to over-deliver that group anyway because they watch more TV, so why should I have to target them? Then I will just really be over-delivering that group. But it's more than just what rating points you're buying. It's what message are you sending? That's right. Because if you're trying to get older people to buy uh, to buy your products, sending them a message that's targeted emotionally though at a 28-year-old is not going to sell the product. So it's got to be that combination of making the right buys and targeting the message. And you were talking a lot earlier about targeting, um, because that conventional wisdom saying, "Well, I'm going to over-deliver them anyway, so I could ignore them." will backfire if they're not speaking to that segment. OK, I think we'll, uh, did, did you want to say something? Go ahead. Next question. We're going to go on to our next, <laughs> some of our next questions, and then we'll do uh, some audience questions again, um, which really is to get a little bit back into um, some of the measurement techniques. This is about the next, gen whoops, 
the next generation of TV measurement. We've talked a lot about different models. We've talked about interactive models and addressable models um, to some degree. So really, um, you know, what will some of the new types of measurement techniques be moving forward in this next generation of, of television environment? Um, will research panels go away? Does all of this data that comes in from machines, from set-top boxes, from servers, uh, mean that there isn't a need to have traditional research panels out there anymore? Will set-top box data be the predominant source? And then um, a question we get asked a lot is, should we be skipping right over set-top box data and looking at a world of IPTV? Because is that the future of television delivery and set-top boxes are, are already becoming obsolete? And how does that change how we measure? So I'll start. I mean, I think set-top box data is fundamental to, you know, media measurement going forward. I think, um, and 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 by the way, that set-top box data can be. I mean, that's independent of the architecture of delivery. So that could be IPTV set-top box data, uh, the likes of which uh, is generated by. Did this grow? Yeah, you can't turn your head. Okay, I'll just. I'll have to look at you then, even though I'm talking to Kathy. Um, <laughs> No, I think, I mean, just because of the precision of it, just because of the, the basic statistics of it, I mean, the, 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 the sample size has to be extremely large in order for you to be able to measure small audiences and to measure subsections of audiences. That's the example I used before, you know, RV owners who, who earn 250000 in income plus, uh, you know, are charitable givers, you need to have an enormous sample size in order to measure that subpopulation very very precisely. So I think something like set-top box data, the volume of data uh, that that throws off is going to be required. I think you will need to do um, data merges, fusions with, with third-party data sets in order to get um, insights into the composition of the households that, the, you know, the box is dumb. The box doesn't say, as, as you alluded to before, the box doesn't say who's watching, right? So you need some sort of overlay of Experian or Equifax or Cycle or point of sale data or even a, that RV manufacturer's unique customer list merged with the data at the account level anonymized in order to derive any intelligence out of it. And then I think um, set-top box data is fundamental to any, any kind of cross-platform measurement system that, that we come up with to be able to measure unduplicated reach across web video and television or mobile video and television, you're, you're going to need to have set-top box data as a, as a basic building block ingredient in order to make any of those measurement systems of the future, um, uh, you know, operable, functionable, statistically relevant. Obviously, we believe strongly in set-top box data, and um, our systems today have data from every single 210 DMAs, every zip code in the country, which really allows us to provide measurement, for example, at the station level um, in markets where um, they have access to information every day about who's watching their, or how many people are watching their programs and ads. I don't think panels go away. I think there are certain business questions that you have to answer with a panel. And then to be able to take that information and then, and then integrate that with these huge databases of viewing behavior is extremely valuable. And so I think there's a place absolutely for traditional measurement of panel, using panels, and then fusing that if, with information that actually correlates with the behavior of what someone says they're going to do versus what they actually do, which is measured in a passive way. So I think that's really um, a critical piece. On the IP front, today we get uh, data uh, from, an, from IP, both on uh, our video on demand, which is server-based information. And then, of course, um, we also, uh, with our partner AT&T, which is a complete I IPTV television system, it allows us to get information from every television in the household. Um, that's great. We would love to see that IP technology uh, everywhere uh, over time. And I think it will happen over time. I don't think it'll happen tomorrow. And so I think that for now, in every case for all the panelists up here, 
We're taking the best sources of data that we have today, presenting as much as we can, and knowing that technology will continue to evolve. And I think in the end, that just makes it easier to get more granular, granular better data. And as long as you have the capacity to be able to measure all of it and to uh, collect it, process it, and present it in a format that your clients can use, it will only get better. I think, you know, yeah, and I echo that. Um, I think it's important to keep in mind that for a lot of kind of people, you know, younger generation, and we see this in kind of online video, you know, broadcaster content being streamed online, a lot of people are doing this through their PCs. And that's a huge demographic, and it's overrepresented among especially really young people. Um, and that's kind of important to keep in mind, and that data set is important to obviously integrate. Um, but yeah, I agree. I mean, the more data, the better. The more data we have, the better. The more census driven, the better, you know? Yeah, I, th I think the PC point is also really important because all this content is being viewed through so many distribution mechanisms now that, I mean, we envision um, at Nielsen a future, you know, hybrid measurement that has at its foundation panels that give, that are able to answer the business questions, as you put it, that can't be answered by the, the dumb machine data. So it sort of has to create the foundation of really understanding the who is watching and the full marketplace, because if you have data from certain providers and not others, you, you have to fill in those gaps and be able to, to create the models, and then also understand how to connect that to what's happening with online usage, so that you can look at movement um, across TV and online. So, so we see a world where these, these techniques and metrics are knitted together, um, so that we have a more holistic picture of what's happening. So I'm going to, um, rather than going into another question for us, see if there's any other questions from the um, audience, because we have time for one or two, I think. There's one over there. There's one over there. Back there. <laughs> Pass the mic. It's like a hot potato. OK, well, earlier, when you asked about Sorry. questions the first time, I wanted to ask, beyond, based on what you're saying here, beyond LPMs, how are we going to look at measuring demographics as broadcasters going forward? Beyond LPMs, based on everything you're saying here, mm -hmm. how are we going to do that? So you're asking beyond LPMs, which are local people meters, for anyone who doesn't know what that acronym is, um, how are we going to get demographic information? So I assume you're asking that specifically of Nielsen. Um, and what we see is a com. Sorry, did you have something else? Are, are, would, would it be something that would be Nielsen and collectively everybody would be involved in mm -hmm. and doing? And if so, I would like to hear what everybody has to say about that question. Okay. So first of all, Nielsen is very open to working with other partners, other data providers, um, set-top box data providers, so that you will see a, a hybrid system that doesn't rely just on our panels, whether it's LPM data or, or diary data. We, we are doing some testing right now that we'll be sharing with the industry next month, um, looking at how we integrate our panel data with set-top box data to create that, that richer measurement. Um, and we see demographic data coming from a range of sources, coming from um, our people meter data around the country that can be applied in a lot of unique ways that we're not using it now. We see it coming from third-party sources like Experian and, and other data providers like that that can get fused into the ratings data. And we also see a future down the road where there are other tools and techniques that can get integrated, right? There'll be an app for that, you know, or um, through social networking. All of these new technologies will also allow for new data collection techniques that will let us get to uh, new ways of creating um, demographic data beyond paper diaries and things like that. So we're looking way out at that world because if you think about it, if we were sitting in this conference 10 years ago, people would sneer at gathering data online. That was not a, a very well accepted research technique and now it's, it's a standard. So we believe that social networking and, and apps and things like that will open up the door to new research techniques as well to get demographic information. Um. My short answer is, in the short term, uh, data merges, account, anonymized uh, data overlays merge at the account level. And in the longer term, 
very, 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 very large opted in single source panels that um, where people will give the panel all of their you know, interest based and demographic information and will allow the panel to measure their usage, their passive usage uh, of, of different media types across platforms. That's the sort of and super we've, duper. We've taken solution. that approach as well. We, we have merged with the Epsilon data, so our uh, database of 17 million televisions has been merged at the household level with Epsilon, and that's how we're providing our demographic information today. In addition to that, we do agree with to, it to an opt-in future. And I know we're running out of time, so I'm not gonna elaborate. Well, on integrating offline source, I'd say, you know, like, behavioral data can matter a lot, too. We know this person likes this on Facebook, or the person that likes these videos also loves these, and clicked on this, and all that kind of integrated together can tell you something much broader. So, I'm told we have time for one more question, and I see a lady in white over there, so uh, you will be our last question in the morning. Thanks. I just wanted uh, him to go first. He had been waiting a while. Um, and you somewhat uh, answered my question through his, but if you can just kind of big sky, and it's more directed to Nielsen than anyone else, there's a bit of a credibility issue with respect to, Niel if it's not kind of sanctioned by Nielsen in terms of measuring the performance of a program, that's what people are looking at, whether you're the CEO or the content buyer or the ad agency. Can you give me a timeline in terms of when Nielsen would then merge or launch into those other uh, social applications you talked about? Well, um, you know, it's, an ev it's definitely an evolutionary process. And, and the social applications that I'm talking about probably are the, the sort of last ones to come as far as truly being integrated into a, a pure a commercial ratings or a commercial measurement product. But we're already on a sort of evolutionary path to begin to integrate set-top box data in with the panels. Um, so we see what has been a pretty tried and true um, set of techniques definitely evolving to incorporate machine-based set-top box data and then other forms. You know, a timeline is really hard to do because the industry sort of marches together in our business. And so we've got to have acceptance from all of the constituents on the buying side, the selling side, because really we provide the data sets that the entire industry then decides that they are going to, to trade with. Um, so it'll evolve as the data becomes available. Um, it'll evolve as the industry sort of wants to move with it. But all I can say is we are very aggressively and very excited about what technology is going to do to let us unleash all of these new ways um, to measure. So you're going to be hearing a lot more about that from us, um, I guess, starting today. And we, uh, but I, I can't really give you a very specific timeline. You know, we're in a fortunate position where you know, our data has been used for so many years, but now there's all of these new exciting ways of integrating it with, with other sources, and I very well expect that we're going to see, I think the buckets of currency is, is the phrase that, um, that Kathy used that I know I've heard, heard Rentrack talk about before. I think that's what we're going to see moving forward. Hmm. Great, well, thank you all for, uh, for joining you. us, and uh, hope it was a, a worthwhile 45 minutes for y'all. Thank you.